welcome. It's the FIH Commonwealth Games show. This is a one-off show, hence the uh, range of backgrounds we've got for our uh, our guests today. But we've gathered together this uh, this wealth of hockey talent and knowledge to uh, chat about the Commonwealth Games, which has just recently um, finished. Um, it finished with Australia men um, winning their seventh straight title and England women winning their first. But first of all, to welcome the uh, the guests, we have Simon Mason, who was commentating on, I think, most of those games. Good morning to you, Simon. Hello there, Sarah. Hi, everybody. Great to see you. We've got Marsha Cox, who will have been delighted by the South African men's performance, although had they gone one place higher and got a medal, that would have been great as well. But Marsha, uh, renowned um, athlete uh, from uh, from South Africa and uh, now a uh, uh, recognised expert on the game. Marsha, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, thanks. And you, Sarah? Yep, brilliant, thank you. And Jammy, we've got Jammy Mulders, who's uh, bringing a sort of an outsider's perspective into the Commonwealth Games, because unlike Simon and Marsha, he won't have competed or been involved in the Commonwealth Games. But Jammy, you watched a lot of the action. Welcome to you. How are you? Morning. And as everybody can see, Jamie is actually enjoying a holiday at the moment. Um, let's uh, let's just head over. We'll talk to um, Marsha first. You were uh, you, you were watching Commonwealth Games. Just um, to start off with your overall impression, not just of the hockey, but of this event as a multi-sport celebration. Yeah, Sarah, I think for a lot of people who are not part of the Commonwealth, they uh, struggle to understand how important it is for athletes um, and how special it is as well. Um, but I thought Birmingham did a fantastic job at just bringing it to life and showing that, you know, one way that we try to explain it is sort of sort of a mini Olympics with all the Commonwealth countries um, and including some other sporting codes as well. And I, I think, um, yeah, Birmingham did a, a great a great job at just capitulating that and um, it was evident for a lot of people who were not part of the Commonwealth just how special it is. Yeah I mean what's so great for people who are not that au fait with the Commonwealth I mean this is um, countries from across all continents of the world so it's not a geographical um, conglomeration of nations it's it's a group of nations we, we had Kenya we had Ghana we had Australia we had um, obviously um, England and Scotland and Wales so it's a real mishmash of teams who wouldn't normally necessarily play each other um, Simon I mean you you were there on site what was the atmosphere like at the hockey stadium because it looked like certainly in the latter days packed out crowds really really excited about what was going on um, that, that sums it up very well uh, the, the the crowds as the competition developed became more and more vocal, more and more animated. They they understood the the sport well, and that's the one of the things you get with a multi sport event is you get people who bought tickets for lots of different things just to get an experience. So it's less of a an educated hockey crowd and more of just an enthusiastic crowd, and it's that that energy built. Some of the crowd took on board and, and took to their hearts some of the lesser nations, the Ghanas and the Kenyans who competed, which was genuinely fabulous to watch. Um, and at the same time, then the, the hockey populace who turned up and the accessibility was fabulous. And it was it was full crowds enjoying um, certainly the last I think the last five days were completely sold out. So six thousand tickets were sold for those those sessions. Um, and they were treated to, to hockey on, on many different levels, whether it was a lot of goals and sort of some fabulous performances. If you look at Australia versus Scotland or it was the Ghanaian, Ghanaian goalkeeper, the men's goalkeeper, deciding he'd build a single African wall across the front <laughs> of his goal mouth, which was truly remarkable. Um, or it was the close toe to toe of, of, of the semifinals or the women's final, whatever it was. So lots and lots of different reasons to support it. And the spectators loved it. Yeah, they did. Um, Jamie, you you were able to um, dip in and out and watch the action. What were your initial impressions of of what was going on, um, and you know, sort of what what teams really uh, surprised you, if you like? For me, it was for me it was lovely to see Kenya and Ghana flying because I have to admit that I haven't I haven't seen them flying. I was just I was really impressed about the level of play of the Ghana men. Um, I was super surprised about South Africa men. I have to say, positively. <laughs> It was so great to see that after all these years of really pushing hard, they really received a reward by reaching the semis. It was it was perfect. Uh, it was a bit devastating to see what what's going on with Pakistan that they that they really can't really uh, let me say close the gap. I really hope for that they really are able to push back a bit uh, to bounce back, but that wasn't the case. And at the end, for me, one it's not a surprise, but it's one of the remarkable things. It's like. How Colin Batches really keep the boys going and rolling every single tournament. So it's it's one of the for me not really well recognized coaches in the world. So he's really keeping them rolling every year, every tournament. 
and the performance they've played in the semis and in the final was was outstanding. So. Yeah, I mean, we'll talk a bit more about Australia in, in a minute or so, but but I agree with you. I mean, we didn't know quite what to expect from Australia coming into this um, Australia men, but uh, yeah, they, they they certainly hit the ground running. Um, we had some um, some big scores in the in the opening um, matches, as you said. You know, uh, for Ghana and Kenya in particular, this was a huge learning experience, wasn't it? And um, Marsha, I, I just wonder if you could just talk a little bit about people quite often say, oh, you know, these big scores aren't good for the game. Actually. Any opportunity to play on an international stage surely is good for the game, isn't it? Yeah, of course it is. Um, you know, yeah, what is good for the game? Game is it's quite a, a a broad statement to make, you know, because um, fans also want to see goals scored. So, uh, yeah, lots of goals in one game, maybe not ideal for for the opponent who's having to to take them. But um, it's definitely entertaining for for the spectators. So I, I always find that quite a broad statement of what is good for the game. Exactly what you're saying for the opponent, for the teams, the smaller nations, if you want to call them that. That opportunity to play and play against some of the best teams in the world is is huge because it doesn't come around every single day. Um, so for those players to have walked off the field and know what standard is required. Um, at that level it's a massive learning opportunity because watching it on tv and actually being in on the field and experiencing it yourself are are two very different things Um, and for the the team that's better it's always good for them to also practice some of their their disciplines against opposition who are just as hungry for for even just one consolation goal yeah I mean the other thing I was going to add there as well is it's not just the on the on the pitch experience but I mean I just come to Jamie as a as a coach on on this one um, it's also how your team prepares and how they get used to the atmosphere and how they get used to the travel and things like that these, these are invaluable parts of the learning process aren't they it, it, definitely but I have to say that it's 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 a discussion I, I I can't really I can't really follow it and I can't understand why we're running this because when you look at other team sports ice hockey handball water polo and all these really multi-sport event sports it always happens and it's part of our in my opinion of our yeah let me say society that we're discussing these kind of things soccer world cup the first games normally are germany's playing saudi arabia six no one is no one is talking about this but in hockey we are and in my opinion it's it's we have to accept and our athletes have to accept we are part of, of a huge society and it's part of this. It's not always about us and what's good for us, what's good for the sport in general and what's good for the other countries as well. And participating, playing against the Netherlands, against Australia, against England is for some nations. It's like an Olympic final. It's, it's, it's for them. It's a tremendous, it's a tremendous thing. And to me, it should be more like we are happy to be able to play these ones and not always play the same ones because we, we grow our sport. That's that's simply the, the biggest fact. And um, I'm more than happy that that these kind of nations are able to participate. It's perfect. Yeah. Yeah, Jeremy say it's so funny that you mentioned that because wasn't it just a few weeks ago that the uh, Euro football, women's football, which was a oh. huge, huge, huge uh, yeah. event, but the, the round one, we also saw scores like seven 0 in any yeah. football seven is is very big uh, <laughs> so. and, you, and you saw you saw England beat in Norway. I explained to my kids that playing Norway, I told them girls, Norway was 10 years ago in women's football, a big, big player, a big, big player. And England made it happen, whatever reasons, to grow the game. And mm. I will not say Ghana will not grow the game, but Ghana will next time. From the experience they gain now from the Commonwealth Games, will play better on African level, and that will help the other ones who are facing them to always increase their way of playing and, and, and understand. Yeah. So it's to me, it's good. Um, Simon, I can just smugly smile about the Euro Women's Football, can't we, Simon? It's, uh, it was a <laughs> great event. Um, I'm just going to stick with South Africa for a minute, if I can. And, and, and actually, um, you probably all got an opinion on this. But South Africa uh, men, this is, in the shorter space of time, have done exactly what we're talking about. They have, um, I mean, the, the start of the Pro League, for example, they were getting hammered by some big scores, weren't they? And now here they are contesting a semi-final in a major event. I mean, I'll, I'll come to both, because Simon's watched South Africa through the last six months. But again, come to Marsha first on that. 
their, their, their rise has been indicative of just what exposure to international hockey can, uh, can, can manifest. Yeah, absolutely, Sarah. I think that the, the one of the, I would compliment this team. Uh, one of the biggest compliments that I would give them is their ability to learn really quickly and to apply those learnings. So what you saw in the pro league um, in the first games, some of the errors that they were making, basic errors, they fixed as they developed in the pro league. And indeed, they, they got better and better in terms of their performance and the results um, didn't go their way or maybe they they weren't even close to, to contesting for, for winning some of those pro league games. But um, you definitely saw an improvement in their performance. And then going into the Commonwealth Games, they used that as their base of, like that as their base performance. And they just kept growing from game to game. Um, so yes, indeed, it, it shows that the exposure helps a lot, but it's also not just having the exposure, but what you're able to, do with all of those key learnings game to game. Um, and yeah, I'm really proud of what they achieved at the Commonwealth Games. I thought with a little bit more experience, some of the um, some of the key moments could possibly be managed better, but that raw talent and that uh, just pure uh, determination and grit and uh, fighting spirit that they show in every game um, definitely also goes a long way. Yeah. I mean, Simon, what did you make of South Africa? Because at times they looked unplayable. You know, they were so quick. They were so um, full of creativity. What what was it that made them stand out for you? In, in the tournament itself, the, the raw speed and skill that they had on the counter-attack, which was remarkable, um, and uh, a penalty corner routine that was working and a good defensive performance. Um I, I was lucky enough, I had, I had dinner with Gareth Ewing towards the end of the tournament and he was talking exactly as Marsha said about the pro league pain and the necessity to go through that pro league pain so the players then understood because you can explain it to players so many times of what it is that they may face but until you actually face it, the understanding of what you need to do and Jamie's smiling, we can, or, or he can as, a, as a, one of the world's best coaches explain on every level with every piece of technology and whiteboard this and video that but until you've played for three minutes and your lungs are falling out because you're trying to chase um, whoever around the pitch, you don't understand. But it felt like they came in with an understanding of what they needed to deliver. The raw pace, I'll pick him out specifically, but Diane Kassim was untouchable pace-wise through the middle of the pitch. Yes, it was a little bit raw and he made some poor decisions at times because he tried to take on six rather than just five. But his raw <laughs> pace was fabulous. Um, and they, they were composed. For a majority, there was still at times, and this is this this is why I think that, that India didn't succeed in the final against Australia, because I think there is a deep-seated underlying lack of belief. So when it actually gets to the real, real sharp end, the final moment, there's a question of can I? And then when it doesn't go right, you then get quite introspective and blame everything else. And so if you look at the bronze medal game that, that wasn't tidy, both teams were exhausted. There was a lot of comments that you could hear about the, the unfairness of the outcome. And as mm. soon as you perceive that a game is unfair, then I believe you kind of lose a little bit of focus. And when they were focused, they were amazing. And that is that is testament to the last six months of growth that we've seen, the programme they've gone through and the belief they now have that they can achieve at the very highest level. And it was very impressive to watch, it really was. Yeah. I mean, in, in a couple of important games, I mean, both in the um, uh, semi-final and then in the bronze medal match, South Africa yellow cards at really, really crucial times. I think it was Matt Chris brown got one and then um, uh, Diane Cassian got one in the uh, in the semi-final. Those are the little things you're talking about that need to be edged out of their game as much as anything else, aren't they? But, I mean, Marsha, the, the, the discipline actually across quite a lot of teams showed, I think, quite a lot of um, naivety in play sometimes. Yeah, also, I think exactly what, what Simon's saying, that their strength is their, is their pace, but... It, um, what I sometimes felt that they could have been a little bit more aware of is at moments in the game when to control that pace, mm. when to actually slow down and just play more controlled um, so that when they they did go again at, at speed, um, they maybe either had more support or more energy to make better decisions. Like Simon was saying that then in moments you, you know, you take on that sixth player uh, when maybe you should take on five. But those, those are the moments that I think um, we, we can improve on. But 
exactly what we started off with, uh, the point that we started this conversation off with is that they learn from playing. And I think yeah. that given uh, these opportunities again, these players, they've proven that they that they apply those learnings. And um, I'm quite excited to see them apply those those key learnings into the next phase. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we'll move on just um, to look at the some of the women's teams now. And, and Jamie, I'm going to come to you. Um, New Zealand and Australia. Uh, we weren't 100 percent certain what to expect. We, we've obviously saw them um, at the World at the Women's World Cup, but it's been a long slog for them. They've been away from home for a long time, um, and they, the two teams seem to cope quite differently. Australia seemed to thrive. New Zealand, I felt at times looked a bit. <laughs> A bit tired, a bit, a bit turgid. What, what were your impressions of the uh, of the two Oceania teams there? I would say the first impression was also at the World Cup that I was surprised that they really can cope with pace and 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 speed of flying because of not being able to fly more than one and a half, two years international matches. So I think lots of credit to both of them and to the staffs and teams how they've managed this. Um, and then I'm not really sure if it's about being away from home. Sure, it has an impact. It's 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 really a challenge to be away from home that long. But at the end, also the results and the way of flying triggers this. Yeah, it also has an impact, certain impact. And, and Australia was some kind of a, let me say, on the rise. So they, it looks like they were really keen on on peaking again at the Summer World Games level. So And it looks like that they were totally fine with what they have achieved at the World Cup. So flying the same ease, stepping into the same ease, flying well. And I think the, the transition that New Zealand is going through seems to be slightly bigger. So it seems to have a slight bigger impact. So they lost a lot of key players and replacing them seems to be really challenging. Signed to the coaching staff. <laughs> so they, they've lost some 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 key key members. So um, I would say it's more the transition phase they're sitting in. And it's a normal, it's a normal up and down roller coaster for, for both of them which Australia managed to me at the World Cup pretty well, and now at the Commonwealth, yeah, tremendously. Yeah. I mean, sure, because, I mean, Australia, well, both of them have had to peak quite quickly. It's not just them. I mean, obviously, India and England and Canada have all done the same thing. They've had to peak quite quickly in quite a short space of time, which is unusual. I mean, Marsha, how difficult is that as an athlete to, uh, you know, get yourself ready for a World Cup and then come down from that and then get yourself ready for a Commonwealth Games? That, that, that's got to be quite intense uh, for that period of time. Yeah, it's extremely intense. And I think that that's where uh, your um, psychological <laughs> support leading up to it, like the mental support leading up to it is really crucial to help you um, identify because, it, you know, it's one thing you've got a physical program that will be designed to help you peak at those two two moments and you've got to trust it and you've got to trust your, your staff and, and your physical trainers that they've given you the best program to allow your body to do that. But whether you mentally can do that is, is always a big question. Um, like Jami mentioned, being away from home for, for lengthy periods of time, we know India were away, were on tour for three months. Like they've been in Europe for three months. Uh, and that is that is a, a really long time away from, from loved ones and in a different environment, different culture. Um, so, your, yeah, I think the, the mental preparation for it is really crucial, but it, is, it doesn't take away how uh, extremely tough it is. And just like in, in the on-field playing moments, sometimes you learn from the experience. It's the same mental learnings. Um, you, you sometimes only know how you individually cope with all of those factors um, after being in it. So, yeah. yeah, it's really, really tough, but um, it's it's been done. And I think the top five teams have been on the road for really long uh, from the Commonwealth Games. So they all played at the World Cup and they all peaked um, twice in the space of a month. And uh, so it's not that it's impossible, um, but yeah, it is tough. Yeah, so and, and some teams just seem to handle it that little bit better than others. I, I mean, Simon, if we just come to the, the semi-finals of the women's competition, um, I think there, I mean, for me, they were they were two matches where the players were absolutely giving it their all. And then obviously they had to pick it up again for a final. But just talk to me about the New Zealand-England match and particularly, because you're a goalkeeper, that performance by Maddie Hinch in the shootout. If I may, I'm just... Jamie seemed to have his hand up as if he yes. wanted to mention something on, on only, a, I, Sorry, I, I thought that. you were sorting a fly. <laughs> no, no, we should not forget. We should not forget the Asian one. So India has been on the road for three months. China even longer, and just because of the the Asian Games have been postponed. 
that should have played, India should normally have played another major event, which is the qualifier. Yes. So it's it's just the challenging challenges they are going through and China was going through and Korea, it's massive. And India mm-hmm. was the one who had to pick Commonwealth Games, World Cup and Asian Games, which is, ooh, that's yeah. massive. Absolutely. We'll follow up with India in just a minute. But uh, so just, go, just going back to both those semi-final times. So New Zealand versus England. I mean, that was that was a slogathon, wasn't it? And then we then the teams had hello there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and then then the teams had to pick themselves up again for the shootout. Uh, yes, in short. I mean, you don't get many nil nil um, games any, anymore in, in central competition. And for the two teams to go at toe to toe as they did. Um, technically, it wasn't it wasn't the greatest game. The turnover rate was quite high, and conversion rate on on set plays wasn't wasn't great. It wasn't the best hockey spectacle I've seen. I'm talking about the the, the England um, New Zealand game for now. Um, so so the, the England New Zealand game wasn't great. The Australia India game I thought was a really a really exciting game to watch, and you felt that that Australia were, were dominant and then all of a sudden a massive, massive swing of momentum. And when, when India got their goal, I genuinely thought they're going to win this. All of a sudden they seemed to find a, a belief and an intensity that they hadn't exhibited. And I think this, in a little way, it comes back to the, the comment I made about the men's, about the, the Indian men. I'm not convinced they have a deep-seated belief against Australia. They do against everybody else. And therefore for the women, was it the same? But when they got their goal and it was a fabulous goal, suddenly you thought they're going to win it. And then the momentum shift into the shootout and the technical issue. And that was that was a far more memorable um, hockey hockey game, I think, for a variety of reasons. The England game, once it went to a shootout, Maddie still has an aura and Maddie saved four from four. Um, I don't think... This is this. People are going to criticise me for this. I don't think she's playing as well as she was when you go back to, to Rio and the dominance that she had. The team, the team has shifted, and therefore I think the way she's playing is a little bit different with some less experienced defenders. But you put her into a one-on-one situation, she still has the reputation, she still has the aura, and that delivers on a number of levels. Yeah, absolutely, and and it goes back again to that sort of that belief you're talking about. If you're lining up against someone who's got this tremendous reputation as someone who, who is a, a penalty uh, or a shootout specialist that's instantly going to put doubt in your mind um move, moving on so so we, we India Australia um obviously India were then in the um bronze medal match um what you know picking themselves up for that final final game Marsha that, that must have that must have taken all of Yannicka Shotman's skill as a coach to get her players up and ready um to, to, to get to the match yeah, for sure. I think that um, it, it, losing that semi-final definitely uh, hurt them, and they had experienced that pain in the World Cup, um, no doubt. And I know that um, they would have taken those those emotions and those learnings from the World Cup as well with them to to the Commonwealth Games. And I was really, really impressed with. Um, yeah, the, the approach to that to that bronze medal game, um, you know, they they worked really really hard, and and to get that reward is is really well deserving. Yeah, I mean, Jamie, you've you've watched India over the over the past few months, that, and and you were talking about them earlier. Um, they're just brewing, aren't they? They're 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 ready to really explode as a major a, a major the women. This is a major team now. Yeah, what, what Simon's talking about the belief, what I think is the the biggest, now let me say, growth and development Yannick has implemented is the belief. So they look to me mentally far more consistent and far stronger than ever before. So when you look at the World Cup, they had several moments, the key game against New Zealand where they bounced back, where every one of us knew before that India or a team from India bouncing back in such a crucial game, Yeah, I'm not really sure. And Yannick has really worked hard on this. And, and maybe... They have some luck in others, other areas of the game, but this is something which was really crucial to become a really top side. And Yannick yeah. has really made sure that this is, is one of their strengths in the approach of the bronze medal game. Impressive. Yeah. Um, we need to shift on. Um, <laughs> I've talked for hours about this. So we, we came to the final um, and there we had Australia, England and um for England, this is a you know this is a historic first. Uh, Marsha, you you watched the game. What we, what were your thoughts on the England performance? 
I was really impressed, Sarah. I won't lie. Um, I really thought um, they were, they came out with a very, you, you could see like their mental focus and their, they were ready for it. They were ready to play. They were ready to take the game to Australia and not uh, wait to see what happens and, and test the waters and then we'll, uh, you know, uh, start playing in the second half. You could see that it was really a focused team that uh, knew what their goal was and they came out from the first minute of, of the game with, with um, like a clear focus to show it as well. And yeah. that's something that we talk about a lot of the time. Uh, yeah, Jamie, you would maybe also like with your players, you would you want to talk about starting the game strong and taking it to the opposition. And, and you talk about all these lovely things, but actually being able to implement it as a team uh, sometimes is a little bit more challenging. And I was really impressed with the England's way of doing it. They were first to every 50-50 ball. They, they just physically dominated any space that they were in um, and they played a really yeah strong attacking game and also yeah they were just so disciplined whereas I felt Australia were maybe caught on the back foot and then just struggled to find their momentum and string passes together and the longer the game went on those frustrations kicked in and and c- certain basics were just slipping further and further out of their hands and I thought uh, England just stayed on top of it and stayed extremely disciplined. From the commentary box, Simon, what, what was your sort of feeling? Did you ever, did you at any point think, oh my gosh, Australia are back in this? Um, I never thought Australia were out of it. So to be back into <laughs> it is a slightly different turn. I mean, you you do you write off Australia at your peril, but I, I do totally agree with what Marsha said. If you'd said to me, what's the first half going to look like? It would not have been the first half we saw. I think the basic skill rate, so the turnover rate because of basic skill errors, I felt was a complete 180 degrees flip to what I expected having watched the tournament. England, I think that's the best they've handled the ball probably in the last 18 months. The longer. conviction of the past. Sorry? Even longer. longer. Even longer. Okay. <laughs> well, even longer. <laughs> I, we watch so much hockey, Jamie, that I don't know if it's 18 months or five years. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the against Australia, in my opinion, the one thing you don't want to do is dwell on the ball. The minute you hold the ball is the minute the press comes. And in the first three quarters of the game before they got tired, I think their ability to take a ball into a space, give it to somebody else, move down a channel and work through the pitch and make the pitch really big. They didn't drift into contact. Basically, they they played technically and tactically. I think they played that game as well as they could with the addition of the physicality that you have to bring. And when they brought all that together... It put the performance there that you that we saw. Um, yeah. Two fabulous goals then. So two moments of individual skill. Holly's ability to take that ball down the circle and absolutely find a middle, the middle of a bat from the edge yeah, of the D. That was a shock. <laughs> yeah, because it's come from a source that you don't expect. Yeah. Tess's mm-hmm. goal was a goal that you would expect her to score. But England at that point were dominating the stats. They were dominating the corners. They were dominating the open play chances. And... It's, it's not an outcome that we expected in the first half. As, as time ticked on and Australia then become a little bit stretched, the game becomes a little more tired and the fatigue kicks in, then fine, the outcome is the outcome. But England's performance in the first three quarters, I thought, was outstanding. Did it surprise you, Jamie? Um, would you, we'll talk about the men in a minute. Just to quick, quickly talk about those two teams, Australia and England. No, no finally not, because for me, it's one of the most skillful teams ever England had in, in, in the area. So it's in the early years, you always had the Sophie Bray, Helen Richardson. Uh, you had these ones who, who were able to really handle the ball quite well. But when you look now at, uh, at Peel, when you look at, at Neil, when you look at Colt McCall and all these kind of girls, Crackles, incredible players, then Hannah Martin up front. And then you don't, I would not say you don't even need Osley anymore, but it's a different kind of balance within the team when you have Osley sometimes running with the ball, carrying the ball. But yeah. then this technical skill set was so good in midfield. that's such a dominating midfield. And then you have these, let me say, experienced players like Ainsley, Webb and Answorth who are really yeah. dominating together with, with Hinge, the back. Then you can say, okay, from this solid platform of being able to defend and build up, and then have players, skillful players. The young one is Wilkinson. Is it the young yeah. midfield player? Incredibly good. And they showed these kind of talent, these skill talent throughout the year. And to me, it's really one of the strongest 
strongest skill, skillful teams England have had for years. Brilliant. Well, we'll take that one. Uh, we've, we're nearly running out of time, so we're just going to talk about the men's final. Um, Simon, Australia, a little bit supreme in that, weren't they? Um, yes, is the short answer. <laughs> <laughs> but if you if you look at their competition as a whole, and it right from the very first moment, it wasn't the final. Um, the final was kind of one of the two outcomes. It was either going to be the semi-final. When I said to the colleagues in commentary, I said, this is either going to be England winning by one mm. or Australia winning by five. Um, it was a slight switch the other way, but I just saw right from the very first game when Australia played Scotland, the the depth of talent around that pitch and the penalty corner conversion rate. I mean, you've got someone like Wickham running every possible line through midfield and then you bring in a young guy like Ephraims and you then add in the wet and behind that and then Govers and, and Hayward on corners there is such and you could keep going just list the whole team um but I there was so much capability in so many different positions right from the very start of the tournament that you thought you know what I, I'm not sure how anybody is going to beat them because Nobody was showing, except for India, nobody was showing a penalty corner conversion rate the same as theirs. And therefore, when they got through that semi-final, I was like, well, I'm not sure what where the depth is from India. That What they'd shown was a little bit sporadic. They'd shown some turnover ball through midfield. They'd shown a lack of discipline at times. And I thought if Australia got an early lead, the danger was that India didn't have the depth of belief that meant they could come back in that, in that instance. And unfortunately two goals in the first quarter. I think if India had got to quarter time on level, then maybe it would have been different, but two goals in the first quarter. And you could see, it doesn't matter if they were unfortunate goals or not, you could see that Australia, because particularly the nature of the second goal was probably one of the best team goals we've seen for a long, long time, right out the bottom right-hand corner, showed a range of pass that was perfect. It was in stride. It was just, it was beautiful. It's, it's a move that coaches, I'm sure, will clip and use around the world, but... <laughs> It was it was so good in so many ways that the, the outcome was no surprise after the first quarter for me. What were your thoughts on it, Jamie? I mean, was there anything that India could have done or were Australia just peaking an unstoppable? Now, as Simon mentioned it already, the belief seems to be completely different. So Australia has the belief that they have the quality and the depth of play. And to me, they have one... I want tremendous player in the center of play is, is Selevsky. So Selevsky is always one of those players who is not only doing his job, he's really making sure that the other ones are performing on a higher level. So yeah. strategically, he is such a brain, it's incredibly. And on the other hand, I'm really a fan of Manfred, watching him playing, but the difference of strategic play between him and Selevsky, for example, that's another level. It's, it's really yeah. the way of Australia is playing and Charter, or Carter, the goalkeeper, he, yeah, is, Andrew he, is all, he, he is so good and he's not really one of those one of those keepers who you're always mentioning in the top three of the world and when you look at his play this guy really knows his job eh? he's really good and this is now for, for, for years so this mm. I was not really surprised I was just surprised about the scoreboard at the end so seven little that's for a final of wow uh, it's a long time ago I must admit, I was expecting at least an Indian goal, but as you say, the Australian defence were fantastic. We're going to wrap up. I'm going to give the last word to Marsha. Um, Marsha, uh, I'd just like you, I'm going to put you right on the spot here. A couple of players throughout the tournament who've really, really impressed you. Yeah, well, we spoke about uh, Maddie Hintz and, um, yeah, stepping up to the plate when it counted the most in those in those shootouts. And I think um, a little bit of what, what Jamie's mentioned now about... Um, other players is that you you know it's not just about your individual ability but your ability to help the team and with new defenders and a new team around her I think that she's done an exceptional job and also just making them feel comfortable and confident uh, in the field um, so she's definitely a standout player for me um, and then yeah on the men's side there's a player that um, yeah of course we know the Kasim brothers but Billy and Thule from uh, South Africa one of the strikers who also found himself a lot of the time on the on the uh, score sheet um, but I found him exceptional in this tournament he he definitely stood out and made people look at him as well and not just the Kasim brothers um, 
uh, coming up the, the field with the, a lot of speed and, and skill. But he was also a player who created plays and, and great finishes as well. And then... Um, I gave you two. You can have one more quickly. <laughs> okay. No, no, go then. Go and whoever's next. <laughs> but those okay. are two standout players for me. We're, we're going to wrap up now because I know um, everybody, well, Simon's dashing off. You're at the um, the Masters, aren't you, in, in Nottingham at the moment, Simon? So anybody who's listening to this and uh, <laughs> get and watch some old guys playing, that would be great. Jam is on go. holiday and Mark is about to fly around the world. So thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thank you so much for giving your thoughts on the Commonwealth Games, known as the Friendly Games. And uh, thank you um, just for taking part in these podcasts. Thank you very much indeed. Thank You're you welcome. so much, thank Sarah. Uh, thanks for all your... Your work and making these shows so entertaining. Um, well, it's been really, really uh, special to be on the show with you and nerding about hockey with uh, not only you, but also a magnific magnificent lineup of, of I'm looking forward to hearing the next host in action, Marsha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much.